Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with veteran Kansas City jazz musician, trumpeter, and flugelhornist Pete Carroll. We caught up with him to talk about his very storied career in jazz, from work on his latest 2020 collaboration with the Freedom Affair on the CD Freedom is Love, to being the lead trumpeter for the Reverend Al Green. After a few seasons touring with Al, he relocated to Kansas City and began performing in local jazz and blues venues while on break from tours. These days, he is recognized as one of Kansas City's most versatile trumpeters and performers with several local and national artists. Due to this COVID-19 pandemic, many musicians have suffered financial loss from show cancellations. He opens up about all of this during this very strange time and a little bit more. And his hope for the future. Enjoy. Cool. Well, hey, Pete, thanks for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz today. I appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure, Joe. Thanks for having me. You bet, man. So let's start off at the very top here. You know, we're in a global pandemic, and the world of music and, you know, the world at large has been totally reorganized and rearranged. Talk to me a little bit about early to mid-March, just kind of how your itinerary, you started seeing things change and how that's kind of mutated up to now. Oh, man, it's mid-March. It's like a, the calendar was full of gigs uh, through the summer even, and almost immediately they all just started disappearing. And it's continued to do so. We've even noticed that even some of our friends that work on Broadway and whatnot, they're not going to be performing until September 2021 at this point now. So it's just been a horrible experience for musicians, uh, especially those that do this full time. Well, I guess the one positive thing for you and for Kansas City is there's been some national exposure through this Apple campaign and with the Apple Watch. And um, you were part of the Freedom Affair and you, right. you played on that. Talk to me a little bit about this experience and kind of how it came about and what it feels like. Oh, man, it's it's fantastic. Uh, the Freedom Affair is a nine-piece, I guess you could call it a uh, funk, soul, groove, uh, more soul, uh, very similar to Sharon Jones and the Dap Kings. Uh, we formed in 2017. It was kind of the idea or brainchild of Chris Hazleton, the bass player in the band, and Dave Brick, our drummer, and it features three powerhouse female vocalists, um, Paula Saunders, Seiko Groves, and Misha Roberts. Brett Jackson and myself round out the horn section. Brett, of course, is on saxophone. And then we've got two guitarists, um, Colby Bales and Brandon Moser. And I guess around this time last year, our single that is featured on the new album, uh, Rise, the album's name is Freedom is, Freedom is Love. And uh, the single, Rise Up, that was released from Coal Mine Records, last year actually got picked up by netflix for uh their uh self-made documentary uh documentary and then somehow got picked up by apple for the new iwatch the series 6 iwatch uh it's been incredible just seeing all this unfold and not knowing that it was happening until very last minute uh chris hazelton i guess we could call him the leader of the band at this point uh basically said we've got some really really big news and I can't really tell you much about it right now, but I'll let you know. Uh, so stay by your phone. And we got the phone call that it was being used by Apple's iWatch uh, campaign, and that was released on September 15th. And then our album came out on September 25th, so just about a month ago the album dropped as well. You know, it almost seems like this band and the message and everything that goes into it is like a revival, not only a revival for a rebuttal against this pandemic, but against all of this injustice and this craziness going on in America. Yeah, for sure. You know, the album couldn't have dropped at a better time. I think um, two tracks on the album specifically really uh, caught my attention listening to it over and over again. Now, there's two tracks on there, um, one of them being Don't Shoot. I, I guess living right now in Kansas City, we just heard the news that we've surpassed uh, – the homicide record uh, this year, this year has been the deadliest of years for Kansas City on homicides. So the message of don't shoot on the record is very important right now. And then I guess the other one right now is One Nation. Um, the, the 
the hook on that or the chorus, you'll hear in there, we'll never be one nation if we can't have a conversation. And I mean, that's just so true right now. What you just said about Kansas City and just kind of in general, the Kansas City music scene has some spokes of national light that get out there. But what does this mean for you and the band to have this kind of exposure from a Kansas City outfit? Oh, it's great. I mean, there's so many, like you said, there's so many artists here in Kansas City that are starting to gain national uh, exposure. But it's it's fantastic for us as well. I mean, we've been really working on this from 2017 when we when we all joined. It's been a collaborative uh, project where everyone brings a certain aspect to the band. Um, the female vocalists all are fantastic writers as well. Um, and just the exposure that it's giving us, it's just it's putting more Kansas City music on the map. It's it's great for the for Kansas City. Talk to me a little bit about your beginnings as a musician and jazz. Talk to me about were you born and raised here in Kansas City? No, I'm not a Kansas City native. I kind of was all over the place. I was born in Philadelphia, and then I grew up, did my middle school, high school, and college in Texas. Um, graduate of Baylor University with a music education degree. And I guess jazz really started catching my interest in middle school. My folks would let me stay up past my bedtime to watch Doc Severinsen on The Tonight Show. Uh, being a young trumpet player, he was my first, I guess, idol in music. And then just got more uh, interested in the music itself and started hearing people like Wynton Marsalis and the people that were really on the scene at that point. Uh, I started playing trumpet in the early 90s, so... Yeah, Wynton Marsalis was just a really big influence on me, and I just loved the music. I loved the freedom of the music. Uh, jazz basically doesn't have any boxes that you have to stay in. Uh, the improvisation aspect of it is what I liked the most. I loved just putting on tracks in my daily practice and playing along with them. So that's what really sparked my interest in it, and then I continued on to Florida State University and received my master's in jazz studies there, and that's where I started my career actually touring. What, talk to me a little bit about coming to Kansas City. What was that like? What was it about the scene when you really got into it that kind of appealed to you? Well, I'll tell you what. The best thing about Kansas City, and I think a lot of other musicians in this town would agree, is the camaraderie between the musicians. Uh, several other cities that I've visited and I've, I've heard about, it's like, oh, for, tr for trumpet players, let's just say trumpet players, there's all these other trumpet players in the city and they're all trying to get the gig and they're Kansas city is not like that. Kansas city is very supportive. I could reach out to any trumpet player that I know in the city and they're going to, they're going to be helpful. Uh, it's not like I'm subbing for somebody and I'm trying to take the gig either. You know what I mean? So, and I love that. I love that about Kansas city. I hear about, I hear that all the time about Kansas city. That's definitely a hallmark about uh, how we do what we do here. And it's very, uh, you know, very reassuring. You know, Kansas City, before this whole shutdown happened, really was surging, really was in the midst of a renaissance. A lot of things were happening. Talk to me a little bit about your thoughts on recovery and kind of, you know, what, what do you see when we get back as kind of the, the, the revival, so to speak, for Kansas City and our resuscitation? It couldn't come soon enough, honestly. I, there's so much being created right now behind the scenes that no one's getting the, uh, getting the exposure to right now that I think that as soon as we are allowed to start performing again and getting stuff out there, it's just going to be flooded. Kansas City is just going to flood the market with such great uh, music. Speaking of all the different musicians in town that are doing that, uh, there's been very recent record releases by like Eddie Moore and We The People um, and just a lot of other people that are so supportive here that, I mean, I think that once we are able to get back out and start performing again and getting our music out there, you're going to see a lot coming out of Kansas City. What do you like the best about being a performer? It's the musical conversations that you get to have between the musicians on stage in that live setting. You don't get that when you're practicing at home with the Abersoul recordings or the iReal Pro recordings. I mean, they're great educational tools, but you don't have that conversation that you get with a live performance the communication be between the musicians on stage. And, I mean, anything can happen uh, just by opening your ears and communicating with each other. And so, I truly, truly miss that. What was the first live jazz show you ever saw that made you think, man, this is something I want to do? The first live jazz show that I ever saw. 
Um, I would probably have to be, and it wouldn't wasn't really necessarily a jazz show. It was actually Doc Severinsen with the Waco Texas Symphony Orchestra. It had some jazz elements in it, but the performance aspect of it is what made me want to do this. They're just seeing Doc Severinsen out in front of that large group hearing him perform and having command of the entire audience was just fantastic. And I, I looked down, I was very young. I was probably 11 years old when I went to that show and I just was mesmerized. I was like, I really want to do that. I want to have that feeling. And I've been fortunate enough to somewhat get that while touring. You know, I don't want to stray too far away from Kansas city. There's a level of centric that goes into this. What do you like the best about Kansas city? You know, I'm going to just go back to the camaraderie. Um, it seems like, well, camaraderie and barbecue. We'll just put it that way. Um, so yeah, the, the music scene here, like I said, the musicians here, it's a different breed of musicians. Not, no one's out to get anybody here. Everyone's so helpful and it's more of like a family. And I think that is a great example of how we need to be everywhere else. Yeah. And I just, I absolutely love that. The one thing I do know is that, you know, I live in Lee Summit. I'm really pushing the fact that um, I'm, Neon Jazz is coming out of Kansas City, but more specifically it's coming out of Lee Summit. And I know that you have um, you have some tent poles in Lee Summit. Talk to me a little bit about your association with Lee Summit. Well, I work in Lee Summit on a daily basis. I'm an insurance agent at the Ballantyne Insurance Agency just in downtown Lee Summit. So I'm here every day. Um, more recently, I've started getting involved with the Lee Summit uh, jazz uh, community trying to get more involved with that. Um, but Lee Summit is just a great little downtown spot that's so close to Kansas City that you can get to Kansas City in a, in a heartbeat pretty much, but you actually also have the small town vibe as well. And I love that about Lee Summit. So you were the lead trumpeter for the Reverend Al Green. That had to be an, Since, an, an incredible experience. It's fantastic. I'm I'm still considered his trumpet player. I've, I've been his trumpet player since 2007, and he's he was able to open up so many doors for me musically and being able to see the world touring. It just fantastic. I mean, he's a living legend, and it's just it's just been fantastic. You know, like like with Al and other people that are big that you you've performed with, what have you learned from the legends and luminaries? What have they given you that not only has translated to you as a performer, but as just a person, as a human, trying to do the best you can? Well, Al specifically, when he's performing and I'm sitting kind of in the background, I get to see that on a nightly basis when he's, when he's performing. And he really, really cares about his audience. You can really feel that uh, by how he performs differently each night. Um, and being able to kind of be a chameleon and judge the crowd and, and really keep their attention the way that he does is just fantastic. He's, Oh man, how do you explain it? Cause I'm, of course everyone's familiar with let's stay together, but when we get to do that live with him, it changes on a nightly basis. I don't think I've heard him sing it the same way twice, which helps me as a musician when you're out playing jazz standards. It's it's a learning tool. I, I always am trying to play a certain tune differently each time, um, putting my own feel into that. And Al just does that amazingly. You know, with this absence of live music, obviously memories of shows with Al and with others that are big and just any other gig, what memories are coming in that are comforting you during this time that you're away from live music? Any magic moments you've had on stage? Oh, there's there's, a, there's quite a few. Um, I think probably the greatest moment that I can that or memory is the show that we did in 2011 in Sydney, Australia, with Al. It was the first time Al had ever por uh, performed in Australia, and the turnout was just unbelievable. They had to turn people away from the gates and it was just an outdoor festival. I think they had over 300,000 people in the stage area and they continued to broadcast our entire show on the sides of buildings in downtown Sydney because so many people wanted to watch that. And wow. seeing that amount of people and seeing how much Al was really loved over there where you went, you just don't think about it. You think Al Green, you think 
Oh, he's known he's known internationally, but until you get to actually experience that internationally, you just don't know how much he truly is loved worldwide. Wow, that's amazing. So during this absence of live music, when we do come back full force, um, you know, when the audience comes back, when the musicians return to the stage, what do you hope we all realize about this absence of live music? Don't take anything for granted. You don't know when things are going to come to a halt again, if they're going to come to a halt again. And cherish the moments that you've got. Um, as a performer, cherish the moments that you've got on stage with your peers. Um, like I said, don't take anything for granted. Um, and as as concert goers or an audience member, take advantage of the opportunities you've got to go see the live music too and support these these artists as well, because without the support, we're not going to be anywhere anyway. So spell out specifically what fans can do to support artists right now. It seems obvious, but it would probably be prudent to have you spell it out. Oh, visit, visit all the, uh, the social media pages, um, buy their music. I, I mean, I can't say it again, but buy, buy their music, visit the websites, visit Bandcamp, iTunes, Download the music. It's it's what we've got right now. It's the lifeline for musicians right now. Um, without that type of funding and support, the music's just going to go away. Like some of the small businesses that we've seen, unfortunately, close as well. It's it's not self sustaining. It we have to have the support of the audience members to continue doing this. Why do you love jazz? The freedom of it. Uh, I love jazz because of the freedom of it. Like I said, it's not it's not uh, specifically something that is written down that you have to play a certain way. Um, you can make it your own. And I love that so much about jazz. So if you could get into a time machine, go back in time, get into that DeLorean, and punch in the digits, where are you going? Who are you going to see live? Oh, my gosh. I'm probably going to go back to... Uh, the late '60s, and see Miles Davis. Yeah. And see Miles Davis somewhere. Uh, either that or Freddie Hubbard. I mean, I know Freddie was with us uh, up until about 2008, I believe. And I had opportunities to see him, and I didn't. But uh, those are my two favorites. You know, Miles Davis and Freddie Hubbard. And I, they're my biggest influences now. And I would love to have been able to see them live, for sure. That's so where the magic wanna- happens. Yeah, I would love to take that ride with you, for sure. Um, so uh, everyone has a perception of you, your family, your friends, work colleagues, uh, fans, but you're the one living your life. Who do you think you are? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I, I think that just I'm a hard worker. Uh, you can't get anywhere in life without putting in the work, and I try to wake up every day and be positive and help as many people as I can. Being in the insurance field now, that's what I do is I help people in their times of need. And I want to really continue doing that, but you have to put in the hard work to get to a certain point. And I think I've put in that work. Uh, I'm not saying that I'm done putting in the work because it's it's continuous. Uh, you have to continue putting in the hard work to get anywhere, and I don't want to plateau either. So just being aware daily of what you're doing and how you can go about helping people. I just think we need more of that in the world today. You know, periodically I've asked musicians, you know, how strong is jazz in America in a certain said year? And I've realized in 2020, since the pandemic, and I've interviewed a lot of musicians since then, I don't ever have to ask that question again. The amount of gigs and the amount of shows and festivals that have been canceled have been staggering. Is that something you've thought about? I have. Uh, I have so many colleagues that this is what they do. This is, I mean, this is their life. They wake up every day and live this every day, and it's virtually gone now. And I know they're struggling, and I know it's been difficult for them. And to see them struggling, to see their stories on social media, to, to take the phone calls and just be a be a listening ear for them has has been difficult too. Uh, I'm blessed that I have a different career right now as well that's helped sustain me through this i'm blessed for that and and it makes me think about those musicians on the drive to and from work every day i think about it and how is so-and-so going to survive if this doesn't open up sometime soon and allow them to do what they're doing for a living it's it's a really sad situation for a lot of musicians and artists out there um and 
I just, I have to say, I keep them in my prayers on a daily basis if this all ends somewhat soon and we can get back to a normalcy. So my final question to you is this, what words of optimism will you impart on, you know, your fellow musicians and even people out there that are really missing and longing live music for, for the return? What would you say to them? I would say, you know, keep putting in the work. This is, this is temporary. Uh, hopefully we can get back to normalcy very, very soon. And don't give up. Don't give up at all on this. This is for musicians. I know how much of this is your life. You have to keep going. Don't stop. Don't give up. And things will get better in the future for sure. Right on. Hey, Pete, um, thank you for taking some time out for me on jazz today. I really appreciate it. Joe, it's my, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it as well. Uh, you're a Lee Summit person now. We have to get together sometime really soon, man, and, and chat it up again. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest cats on the East, West, South, and Midwest here in America. And thanks to Pete for his time, music, and story. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.